Well, good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to the Sir Bobby Robson Suite here at Portman Road for the third Fans Forum session of this season. Great to see you all, and a warm welcome also to all those who are watching via the club's official YouTube channel. This will last about an hour and a half, and really the idea is that it's you, the fans, we want to hear from. I've got loads of questions as well, if need be, but I'm sure you won't let us down. You've got plenty of questions. And also, we put it out on Twitter. I think it was yesterday, and we've got lots of questions from people who have decided to sort of take part via Twitter who can't be here tonight. So plenty to ask our three very special guests. So would you welcome them into the suite, please? Uh, Mark Ashton, our CEO. And a couple of gentlemen making their Fans Forum debut, our manager, Kieran McKenna. <laughs> Closely followed by Director of Performance, Andy Rolls. This is very much our time, and of course, it's very much your time as well, particularly tonight with a question. So we'll go around and hopefully take many questions from you. Seb here is the man with the roving microphone, and we would ask that uh, if you wouldn't mind standing up while you're going to you know, give us a question, tell us your name, and then uh, fire away into the microphone. Uh, first of all, let's have a quick chat uh, with the men on the top table. Mark, this is our time. It, it, it certainly feels like it, doesn't it? It certainly feels like a busy time, I know that. Um, yeah, I think you know, we're almost coming up to the, the one-year anniversary of the, of the Game Changer takeover, nine, ten months into, into my tenure. Boy, it continues to be busy, but there's a feel-good factor uh, around the football club, um, and I think both of these, these gentlemen are playing a, a huge part in that, and I think we look forward to, to taking your questions this evening. And Kieran, what a start you and your team have made. Yeah, it's, it's been nice to get off to a good start. Um, I can say thank you to you know everybody here and I guess to the rest of the, the supporter base for the fantastic welcome that we've had. Um, I'm loving it. My staff are, are really enjoying being at the football club and we're enjoying you know representing you guys on, on the pitch. And um, thankfully it's gone okay so far, but we, we hope to keep getting better. And Andy, you joined the club uh, back in May, previously worked at Arsenal and West Ham United. So what do you make of ITFC? Yeah, it's been fantastic. Um, I'm sure you've heard Mark say it several times. We uh, came in together. The club's much bigger than I ever thought. I've obviously been a football fan for years. Um, but no, it's been fantastic. Still lots to do, but we are hopefully heading in the right direction. OK, we'll take some questions now from the floor. Who would like to, to kick off? Gentlemen at the front here, if you'd like to stand up and, and give us your name as well so that everyone at home can hear you and we can hear you here. OK, Mark, this will be your first summer at the club. What are your priorities for the club this summer? What do you intend on doing? Where do I start? Um, <laughs> I, th I think you, you, we, we break that down into probably um, two areas. I think the, the key priority is, is to support Kieran uh, and the management and the coaching staff in, in, in player recruitment and player trading. In every summer, there's players in, there's players out. Um, I've got to be honest with you, I hope it's not as busy as last summer. I'm, <laughs> I've said this before, I'm not sure I've got that another one of those in me. Um, but planning is well underway for, for the summer. You know, we, Kieran's only 14 weeks um, into his tenure at this football club, and we forget that, and I forget that at times. So I think we'll, we'll, we'll certainly be busy in the, in the transfer window. Uh, and then off the pitch, wow, there's a lot going on. Um, you will have seen that we've acquired the land uh, behind this stand. We're breaking through the corner, um, new dugouts. We're looking at digital perimeter advertising boards, um, big screen installations, um, general upkeep and upgrade of many, many areas of the stadium. The PA system upgrade has commenced. There's a lot to do both on and off the pitch. Delighted that season ticket sales have, have gone on sale this week. And I think, you know, they've got, what, just 36 hours into those sales now. We've sold over 2,000. 
And what's really interesting is within the 2,000 that we've sold in those first day and a half, 41% are new season ticket sales. So I think that bodes very, very well. So there's lots to do, and we're going to be communicating some of these projects in more detail over the coming weeks. I'd, I'd encourage you to watch this space because it is exciting times for your football club. Okay, next question, please. We'll just move slightly towards the back so we, we cover the whole of the area. Oh, just a bit of a, maybe a little bit of a trivial question for you, but make, make it easier for you, Mark. First of all, I'd just like to welcome you, Kieran, and to all your staff. I think I can probably speak on behalf of all supporters and that you've given us something to hope for after a long, barren spell at this football club. Um, just a little trivial question. There's something that's come up with me and my mates in, in, in the ground here probably over the last four or five seasons. We actually wonder why we bother having ball boys and ball girls, because they do tend to stand there, just sit there and watch the game. <laughs> <laughs> they don't actually move. <laughs> Well, they'll probably do less of that with, with Kieran in charge because we, team, we, we, team, we keep, tend to keep the ball all the time. Um, um, but yeah, no, they're an important part of our team. It's a, it's a, difficult, a, a difficult task for them. Um, one of the things that we will be doing this summer is um, the photographer pits, pits that are around the stadium we're going to fill in um, because I'm scared to death that somebody's going to fall down them. Um, and, and we can do it in more effective ways. But, yeah, the, the, the ball boys, the ball girls, are, they play an important role, but I think they do have a difficult job, in fairness. Yeah, I, 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 tend, to man sorry, Kieran, I tend to manage the ball boys and ball girls and form that link with them between us, and it's difficult to tell them outright they've got to do that for us and that for the opposition. So it's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, quite a, it's quite a tricky balance to get right, really. When I worked with, um, with, with Jose, he was, a, he was a master of not just instructing the players, but instructing the ball boys as well and ball girls on any given match. So I've, I've taken a few tips from him on that as well. So um, it just might need a little bit of crowd participation if um, we need a bit of time wasted or a bit of time sped up. So we'll, we'll get to that. Because the ball boys and ball girls obviously transfixed by our wonderful style of football now. <laughs> Let's hope so. Let's hope so. Because it is a different star that we've um, not, not seen for quite some time here. And you obviously like the team to zip the ball around on the deck. Yeah, that's, that's how I like to see the game played. That's how I like to, you know, um, it's how we train. It's how we try and develop the footballers. We feel like it's, it's the best way to, to improve the players, to improve the team and win games. And hopefully, I think, and, and getting that impression that it's, you know, a style of football that... Uh, the people of Ipswich are, are proud of and that, you know, represents the traditions of the club. I know, you know, Ipswich has always been a club that can vary it at times and even the great teams of the late 70s and the 80s were able to, to mix their game up a little bit. But I think in, in essence, since I was a, a young boy watching football, Ipswich was always known as a really good footballing team and um, produced good football teams and good players that are played in the right style. So, you know, that's something I think that fits in really well with my philosophy, um, something that I've, I've tried to impart from the first day here and, and something that thankfully the, the supporters have, have really got behind um, on match days and the players are enjoying and, and we look to keep bringing that forward. And a fantastic atmosphere. Has that surprised you? Um, not surprised me because I think you, you heard from the outside what a, a fantastic supporters base and um, you know what a fantastic heritage and tradition that the club have and how big the obviously you can see in the numbers we're, we're getting 20,000 plus I think there's been 20,000 plus for every home game that I've had um, I've seen some numbers about where that sits in the whole realm of English football but even where we are at the moment in the English pyramid we're still you know right up there in terms of all the professional football teams in England in terms of support that we get um, so I, I knew the support was was fantastic I guess what I can um I can be thankful for and be pleased with is, is how vocal they're getting behind the team at the moment. Obviously, that's easier when, when you're winning games, which generally we have won games, but I felt like there's also been you know, tough times in games where the crowd have, have got behind us. Um, a couple of away games, maybe like the, the AFC Wimbledon game or different games where we haven't had the lead at half-time and the crowd have really pushed us on in the second half. Um, the crowd behind the goal at, at MK in the second half was, was amazing. You know, it, it helped us get that pressure in the second half in front of, was it 7,000 plus that day? And, you know, we really pushed for the goal, weren't quite able to get it. So um, I've not been surprised by the, by the numbers. I've not been surprised by um, how much it means to people. I guess what we can be not surprised but thankful for is the way that the, the crowd are participating in the games that are really um, getting involved, getting behind the team, sticking with us at the moment whenever 
you know, it's difficult times in games. I think anyone here can see there's, there's certain games in this in this league where teams want to frustrate us. They want to frustrate you. They want to maybe bide time. And um, that's, I guess, a credit to us as a, as a club because they're respecting, you know, our, our heritage and our football on the pitch. But that's when we need to stick together and the crowd need to stick with the players. And, um, you know, I think that support's been really good. And, and I just ask that 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 continues and, and we can grow that, that relationship and that bond with the players because it's really going to help us on the pitch. And the away support as well, absolutely fantastic. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, I said that that's just a couple of games that, that came in my head, the, the MK, the AFC, but I, I could mention every game. Um, yeah, the Oxford game last weekend, the, the atmosphere was, was amazing when we scored that that goal over, you know, in, in that end when, when Burson scored the goal, the, the reaction from the fans was fantastic. Um, if anything, the players, I think, maybe got a little bit too emotional in that because, um, you know, they do they do genuinely want to do so well for the club and it, it means so much to them when they have, you know, that surge of support from the crowd. And um, that was maybe one thing from that game. We didn't actually manage that that emotion um, as, as well as what we could have done. Um, but look, in general, that the support at home has been fantastic, but the travelling support, the way that, you know, people are giving up their, their time and money to get behind the team and, and we're out outnumbering and certainly outvoicing some some teams that we're playing away from home has been you know a credit to the football club thanks to susan who got in touch um, via twitter to mention the level of support there also dan on twitter this is for you andy if you don't mind um, can we get a rundown please of what the performance department looks like and what everyone does <laughs> that's a good question, good question. <laughs> yeah i think uh, i see the performance department's main job is to take as much rubbish away from the manager as possible so that he can only concentrate on what he does in training, what players he buys and what team he picks. So my big, that's what I see as my main job. And then underneath me, I have more specific people. So Matt Biod has been here for many years as head of medicine, Andy Costin, head of sports science, Ivan, head of s and C. And then I have a uh, responsibility with Stuart and Luke with arranging of the transport. So again, the manager hasn't got to worry about where are we eating, what standard hotels we've got to do. And then to collectively we come together with the manager and we work out what days we're going to train, what's the hard days, what's the easy days. But I think the summing up really is the to allow the manager to concentrate on the football. OK, let's take some more questions from the floor. Let's go towards the back now. Seb is the man with the microphone there. So plenty of hands up. So lots of questions coming our way. Yeah, thank. This is a question for Mark, really. It was just, um, just one about the women's team. And obviously they're doing really well this season as well in with the chance of getting promoted and obviously had a great run in the FA Cup. I just wondered what your plans were, what the club's plans were rather, sort of long term for the facilities for the women. I mean, the plan at the goal site at the moment, is it that they have a, a pitch of their own eventually or um, some investment to help me sort of bring up the standard of the pitch at the goal start, things like that. Have the club started thinking about that yet the, with the sort of the eventual aim for the team to go even further up the women's pyramid? Uh, I think we take it step by step. I, thi I think Joe and, and the team have, have, have have done extremely well and continue to do extremely well. I think it's really harsh in, in, in their league that they could end up winning this league and still not get promoted. It just doesn't feel quite right to me. Um, we've had to fill in forms and documentation, uh, I think it was last week or the week before, on how we would operate in the championship should they be promoted, so we're across all of that. I think the, the reality is they'll stay at the stadium that they're, they're playing at currently. Um, once we have a new pitch here and a pitch that can stain some more games, they'll play some. They won't play all of their games, but they'll certainly play some of their games here. It gives us an opportunity even to look at one or two double headers. Um, so you could play a men's game and a women's game uh, directly after that. But we can only do that once once the new pitch is in. Um, I think what I really like about what Joe has done in the women's team. They are so tight-knit that his staff and his players, they've come through the academy, to the development squads, they've come all the way through the age groups together. And I think that's quite, quite unique. And I think what's really important, to whatever league that our women's team play in, is that we have a development pathway uh, for young girls and young women in the Ipswich and Suffolk community so they can see that they have a pathway through to women's high-level Elite, uh, elite football. So whatever level they're at, it's really important that we continue that. They've done us so proud this season. Um, myself and some of the players were, were, were at the Cup game the, the other week and we, we thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope I'm not the unlucky charm because I turn up and they lose. Um, but no, it's great. And Kieran's fantastic because Joe spends time with Kieran. Um, he watches training. He learns from Kieran. They communicate. 
Um, they're an integral part of the football club and they hopefully will go on this journey with us. Okay, next question please. We're right at the back now, so if you had your hand off the oh, back there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you're able to stand... Yeah, I, 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 I can stand, stand, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, hold on, I need my glasses and I've written this because uh, I thought I might freeze on the stage, so... Uh, <laughs> Right, so a question for Kieran. Uh, and before the question, I'd just like to say how seamlessly you've made the transition from coaching to management and took it in your stride because it is a massive difference and credit to you for that. Thank you. The question, right. <laughs> my, concern, my concern is that we could lose you <coughs> due to being how good at what you do. When the level you operate at has levels above it, can you, I can't see my words, mate. Right. When the level you operate at has levels above it, vultures circle. Are you satisfied that the aspirations and ambitions of the club match your own and can be achieved at Ipswich Town with you at the wheel? Unless, of course, England come knocking at the door, <laughs> as they invariably do when we have a decent manager. Thank you. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I'm just thinking what my Irish family would think if I answer that about England, or what my English family would think if I answer that about Ireland, so that's what was going through my head. Um, no, look, to be honest, I wouldn't be at the club if I didn't think that it could match my ambition. Um, obviously, I've, I've moved here from the biggest football club in the world, a football club that you know has um, a really special place to me that I grew up supporting and that I felt I had a, a really big part of going forward in the future. So I didn't want to make the step, as I said, when I arrived, I wouldn't have made the step to, to any football club. I wanted to go somewhere where there was a, a project, um, where there was the potential to grow something. Um, and to be there over a, over a good period of time. Um, so that was the type of project that I was waiting, waiting for. Um, that was the type of project that, that Mark and, and the club presented to me. So um, that was very much my intention coming in here. Um, from what I've seen firsthand, that, that feeling has only been strengthened in terms of the, the ambition of the football club and the, the potential of the football club um, if we all get behind it. Um, we know that that's going to be a long journey. Um, I'm, I'm here to, to be a big part of that journey and to help guide the, the football club where it wants to get to and, and obviously where ultimately I want to get to as a, as a manager. Um, I feel like I've obviously worked at the highest levels of the game in, in club football and, and feel confident there. Um, and I feel like that's somewhere where I want to be again. But, um, you know, that's a journey that I want to take with Ipswich Town. Um, that's the direction that I want to develop this football club and, and that's certainly where all my concentration is going to be. Okay, thank you very much indeed for that question. Hands up if you'd like to ask a question yourself. Hi, Hi there, my name is Trish and my question is for Mark. Um, you've already alluded to the fact the season tickets are going quite quick and I think they will go phenomenally well. The question is, what are you going to do about the gold cards for the away support? Because it is already an absolute nightmare to try and get um, away ticket. So, will you change it, or what are your plans? It, it's a it's it's a difficult challenge, and the, the, I think that the the difficult challenge is partly through to the division that we're we're currently in. Because when we play, for example, if we play away at Sheffield or we play at MK Dons, ticket allocations are big. If we are going respectfully to to Morecambe, um, it's it's always going to be a challenge. One of the things that, that we are looking to bring in, I, I'm not sure it'll be in for this summer, we are bringing in um, a substan and I mean a substantial upgrade to our stadium entry system. So that means we are totally overhauling the loyalty points reward scheme. And I think moving forward, that also needs to be linked into rewarding ticketed priority moving forward. It's gonna take a bit of thought. I think as we move through the divisions, the easier that becomes because if you're going away to, to big championship clubs and the allocation's bigger. Um, but I would repeat what, what Kieran has said, our away support 
has just been in I couldn't believe MK Dons and I don't care what MK Don said there were more Ipswich Town fans in the stadium than MK Dons fans in the stadium let's be very clear on that um, I think it's a point well made and I think we've got to try and be creative and look at solutions to support all of our travelling fans Thank you very much indeed for that who else have we got to ask questions I've got plenty here from um, various social media sites and messages but obviously you're here in person this evening so we want to get to you if we possibly can Hi, my name is Marion. Sorry, I'll just make sure I don't kick my beer over. Um, <laughs> a question for Kieran. Um, I freely admit I hadn't heard of you until you were appointed, and I suspect a lot of people in the room were the same. But you had such a good CV, so that was really encouraging. But what worried me was that you've only worked at pretty much the elite level. And um, lots of us know that managing people is a lot easier if you've got really good people under you. And I, so I was, I was just a little bit concerned that when you got down to our level, League One, that it wouldn't be quite so easy for you. But clearly that was an unfounded um, fear because you've taken to it like a duck to water, as somebody said. I just wondered, have, have you found anything difficult? Because clearly you do the media and all these sorts of things well. So what's been hard for you? Thanks, Marion. Um, there's challenges every day. I think as, maybe as managers or coaches, probably we try and make it look and make it look easy and um, give that perception that is easy, but it's, it's certainly not. Um, so I guess if we're giving off that perception, then we're probably doing something half right. Um, but that's, that's certainly not the case. I think there's, there's challenges every day, but I don't think the challenges are necessarily you know, that different across the levels that you work at. Obviously, um, yeah, there's certain things that being at a, a Manchester United or a Tottenham Hotspur that is different, but in essence, as a, as a coach or a manager, you've got you know, a group of 20, 20 plus footballers who come into work every day. They want to be improved. They want to be developed. They want to enjoy training. They want to be challenged. Um, and you need to be able to speak to them and manage them and um, find ways to connect with them in different ways. Um, and then that's the, that is the chunk of your job. You then try and put that together into a team um, and try and prepare that team for the game at the weekend and um, make sure that that team goes out and knows their jobs and... Um, tries to go and perform on the pitch and, and represent the clubs with pride. And I think them, them things don't change too much across the level um, that you work at. I think within that process, there's, there's hundreds of challenges every day. I don't think you have the, the amount of grey hairs that I have at 35 years old without a, a lot of challenges. Um, and a lot of late nights, a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of early mornings and a lot of long hours and a lot of sacrifice. Um, but, you know, that's a, that's a part of the job. It's, it's a job that I really enjoy. Um, Obviously, I've got a, a good family that support me with that and, and um, you know, help me behind the scenes and, and obviously, um, you know, a good staff around me who help me as well. So, um, no, in terms of the challenges, it's, there's, there's so many challenges every day, but they're, they're generally enjoyable challenges and, um, you know, it's challenges that I like to, I like to face and like to take on. And, um, nothing has, you know, surprised me about coming here. Nothing has surprised me really about taking the step from being a coach to being a manager it's all things that I feel like challenges that I've, I've prepared for and um, feel that I'm, I'm certainly going to give them all my best shot and Kieran has it helped you settle being in the, the best county in the country <laughs> <laughs> absolutely um, no the, I've said it, I've, I've really loved the area um, my family's been you know up and down quite a few times they were with me over Christmas as I've, I've said before um, at the moment they're they're again um, gratefully from my point of view doing a fair bit of travelling up and down from Manchester as am I um, but we're looking forward to getting moved down hopefully in the, in the near future um, yeah, we're, we're looking to yeah, obviously settle in the area and, and um, yeah, get a house and, and get the kids into school down here so no we, we really like the area um, and I'm looking forward to seeing my family settle here and hopefully the kids will, will have a good time in the area and we can get them out to the seaside in, in the summer time and Certainly they'll enjoy more good weather than what we used to have in Manchester and, and certainly what we had in the west coast of Ireland where I'm from. So I'm already enjoying the Suffolk sunshine and um, the Suffolk hospitality and, and look forward to more of it in the summer months. And certainly when I think back to some of the, the great managers down the years, um, Sir Alf Ramsey, Sir Bobby Robson, uh, George Burley, they all moved to Suffolk, of course, uh, for the job and stayed here. <laughs> Couldn't leave. 
Yeah, I've told I've told uh, Louise, my wife, that as well. I've said this this could be it. We might not end up moving. Um, yeah, it certainly uh, seems like a very nice place to live throughout your your years. So uh, I don't plan to retire anytime soon. Um, hopefully, I've got a good few years left at it. But I could uh, certainly see my, myself spend plenty of my retirement years along the coast. So who knows? Fantastic. Let's bring Andy back in. Uh, Andy, we've got a note here from Steve who got in touch on Facebook. He says that uh, injuries seem to have been reduced this season. At one point there was a, a clean bill of health. Have you and the performance team been pleased with the injury record, if, if pleased is the right word? No, definitely. And uh, that whole performance team I talked about earlier have worked very hard on that. Often it seems to fall on the medical team. The response, if you have lots of injuries or not very many, the medical team get labelled with that and it's often unfair. It's a much bigger team. It's coach, manager, performance director led. Um, no, we've been very good. We set our standards very high. If you're a Champions League team, your um, percentage availability for Champions League teams is 86%. We've set our aim for 88% for the season. That's one of our KPIs going through. And we've had, I take that every Friday at lunchtime. There's been three Fridays this season we've been below that. Um, and I think with the increase in training since Kieran comes, has come in, we've been very pleased with that, yeah. Mark, you mentioned uh, earlier about the land which has been purchased behind the Sir Alf Ramsey stand, this very stand, of course. Um, James McCallum has asked via social media what the plans are for the land. Can you say at this stage? Uh, there are no specific uh, plans. Uh, let's not be really honest with you. What happened was it, the, the acquisition of the land... Um, it was very clear that be had become available. So myself and Mike O'Leary talked about that. It was probably the one piece of land surrounding the stadium that we could acquire, um, and the only piece of land that we'd probably be only to able to acquire for the next 10, 15, 20 years. So we spoke to the ownership group, and they were, were fantastic, and they said, yeah, let's get it under, under the club's control. Um, I think in the short term, um, we'll look at how best we can use it to drive revenue and maybe support match day activities, etc. Um, and then in the medium to, to the long term, we, we've already developed um, really good relationships with both the borough and the county council. And we'll enter into almost a master planning exercise where we can look at all of the land around the stadium and how best we take it forward to, to enhance all stakeholders. So at this moment in time, we, we have the keys. Um, and there's amazing space in there. That, that the units are huge. Um, we've got car parking front and rear. It protects the back of the stadium. So when we've got games that are on broadcast, we need somewhere to park the broadcast trucks. Had we not acquired that land, we would have had nowhere to park the broadcast trucks. So it protects us. Uh, it increases, if you like, the value of the football club because it's, it's land that we can use to, to develop and support it. So... Again, short term, I think we'll find some sensible uses whilst we develop big, medium and long term plans for it. One of many plates you're spinning at the moment. Ju just a few and hence I've I'm, I'm definitely got more grey hair than Kiva, I'm <laughs> for sure. <laughs> right, anybody else from the floor please? Hand up as high as you can. Gentleman in the front here. Uh, I'd just like to ask um, Kieran, as you retired when you were sort of 25 or whatever it was, and Tristan Noydan has had to retire, Will the club help him get his coaching badges so that he might get the chance to be a manager when he's sort of your age? Or how's the situation with that? Yeah, I think that's very much the plan at the moment. I was the same age as Tristan. I was 22, um, having already had you know probably 18 months out injured. So a very similar situation to to Tristan. Um, I got the chance to meet him within my first couple of weeks, and you know people had explained to me his situation. So um, we got a chance to speak and. Um, yeah, I was obviously able to share my experiences, um, hopefully offer him some words of encouragement. Um, but he seemed very much uh, down that path anyway, very, very driven, very much. Um, when I spoke to him in a positive frame of mind, looking forward to the future, and he said coaching was one thing that he um, wanted to proceed with. Um, and the club are, are currently, I think, working with him on that. So um, I think that plan, plan is currently being put in place. He'll obviously have to work through his licences. Um, but he'll also have the opportunity, as I believe, to, to come in and work alongside some of the academy coaches to pick up experience. So, um, yeah, as I said, it's, I think everyone's already at the club wish Tristan their best. Um, as I said in my, in my last press conference, I think when, when one door closes, another door opens. Um, I think when you have such a setback at, a, at an early age, um, 
you know it can it can knock you but also it can strengthen you and, and build resilience in your character and um you know without knowing it Trishan will have picked up so many life skills coming through a, an academy people probably don't realize you know the amount of transferable skills that you have to develop in yourself as a young footballer to reach the level that Trishan already did so um, I'm sure he's going to find a way to use them transferable skills to, to be successful in his future. And if coaching is what he, he decides the pathway that he wants to take, then that's something we'll, we'll definitely support him with. Nobody knows how he must have felt when that decision had to be made, but you, you would know better than most, Kieran, wouldn't you? So that must have come in very handy when you were chatting to him. Yeah, I think so. I think it's... Yeah, I've seen to have met a few different... You know, players down the down the way because when somebody has that situation, I'll I'll try and to try and get a chance to speak with them because obviously it's a, a situation I've been through. Um, Tommy Hughes was another one at the club who had gone through a really long term injury, um, not very dissimilar to mine when I arrived. So he was actually one of the first people who, who came to knock on my door when I arrived, not for football advice, but to ask about the injury. And um, you know, touch wood at the moment, he's he's progressing back from that well and and getting good minutes in the under twenty three. So. Um, Look, it is, it's, it's part of professional sport, unfortunately. It's a, it's a challenging thing to go through. Um, I think Tristian's situation is similar to mine at the time where you have quite a long time to prepare for it. He's had so long since the initial injury that he's already had 18 months, two years of you know, sort of mentally preparing himself. You sort of know what, what might be coming down the line and thinking about moving on to different avenues. So, um, yeah, it's an experience that you wouldn't obviously wish on anyone, but something that... You know, lots of, of sportsmen, unfortunately, go through. And, um, you know, like I said, it's about how you, how you turn that um, negative experience into, you know, a positive fire within yourself to, um, you know, progress your, your career and, and enjoy your life in different ways. And um, I said, when I, when I spoke to Trishan, he very much seemed that he was um, a fair way down that pathway already and looking forward to the future. And so hopefully he's, he's got a bright future ahead of him. Let's hope so. We wish him all well, of course. More questions, please, from the floor. Gentleman with the beanie hat on there. Hi, Kieran. Um, Mark was saying at the start about supporting you in the summer. Have you got in mind what sort of players you want to bring in to strengthen us just that little bit to make us that much more better than we are? We Obviously, we're good now, but obviously, do you know what sort of thing? And um, are you and Mark going to tie Wes Burns up at the end of the season and lock him in a room so no one takes him away from him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm sure Wes will appreciate you badgering Mark about his contract so you can fire them Mark's way and see what he can get tied down. Um, no, um, for sure, we have to improve the squad. Um, we feel like we're in a, in a pretty good place in terms of the squad. Um, part of my initial impression when I arrived in January was that the squad need to be trimmed a little bit and, you know, possibly lose a little bit of depth, but add a little bit more quality and specific qualities where we needed it. So that was the main focus in January. Um, but now going into the summer window, for sure, it's about improving the, the quality that we have in the squad and um, taking that to another level. Um, I have very much a, a clear profile of the type of players that I would like. I've spoken to that, you know, from the, from the first interview. Um, we need a balanced squad um, of different types and different ages, but primarily I want the team to be built around a young, hungry, technical and, and athletic um, group of players who have a real passion to play for this football club. Um, so that will, be our, that will be the base, that will be the, the dynamic and the nature of the team going forward. Um, but of course, as you're building a squad, you need also that, that mix of you know, a couple of experienced players who set a good example and, and have been through you know, the different levels of football and can lead some of the younger players as well. So we are very much quite a way down the process now of, of having the profile of players that we like and the profile of players that we want to not just recruit from the outside but develop within the club. And um, we have the positions in particular that we're particularly going to target in the summer um, for them and, and we're in the process at the moment of working through some of them targets and making sure that Hopefully we can get some good business done in the summer um, and get it done as early as possible in general so that we can have a, a good full pre-season with the, the majority of the group, which is something that I'm looking forward to. Obviously coming in in the middle of the season is, is, um, is a challenge in different ways in terms of um, being able to fully put your imprint on things. Um, and I'm looking forward to having a full off-season programme and a full pre-season programme and some non-competitive matches where we can 
work with what will be hopefully an improving group in the summer. Okay, more questions, please? Anybody got a question? We've got one in the middle of that. Seb? Hi. This is for <coughs> this is for Kieran. Welcome to a fantastic football club. Um, what would you say has been your biggest influence in your short career so far? Who has been your biggest influence? Having been at the one of the biggest clubs in the world to been at the greatest club in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and I really believe that. Yeah. Thanks, Seb. Um, I'm a believer in football that I think your first influence when you move into coaching is your first influences are really, really important. Um, I've obviously picked up so many things along the way. I worked, I think, under maybe nine different managers at Tottenham as a player originally and then as a, as a coach with the youth team. Some fantastic managers there. Um, three different managers at, at Man United in, in my time there. Um, so I've picked up so many different things from so many different people. I worked international level with, with Jim McGilton, who was, again, um, somebody I picked things up from. So you pick up things from people along the way. Um, probably, I think, if, if you were to say what is at times you're defining um, or what can be defining is your first influences. And as I've went on record before, I was very lucky with my first influences. Um, I got my finished my career through injury at, at 22 at Tottenham. Um, at that time, I think the, the academy was really, you know, country leading and, and possibly European and world leading at that time. Um, you had at that time John McDermott as the academy manager, who's gone on to be the technical director of England. You had um, Alex Inglethorpe was the under 18 manager, who's gone on to be the academy director at Liverpool. Um, you had Chris Ramsey there, who's, who's one of the best coach developers and, and player developers in the country. Um, and when I finished at 22, they, you know, as I've, I've went on record before, I was coaching on, I was coaching on crutches. Um, as soon as I, I had my last surgery, they spoke to me and said that they thought coaching was something that I was going to be really good at from my personality as a player. And um, they took me, you know, under their wing as such. And um, I was one week out of the surgery and out working in the youth team with, um, you know, what I think at the time was some of the best young coaches and developers in, in the country. Um, the youth team at that time was um, Harry Keane, Andros Townsend, Ryan Mason, Stephen Cork, or um, Adam Smith, who plays for, for Bournemouth, John O'Beeka. I, I could name it. It was probably one of the, the strongest youth teams that I've ever seen. Um, Pardon? Yeah, Danny yeah. Here for yeah. A while. yeah, he came here on loan. Um, so at that time, it was a, a fantastically talented youth team, a fantastic group of staff, and that was my first experience to coaching. So you see certain things as a player that you think you like or you like, don't like or you think you know some stuff. Um, but within two weeks of, of working with them guys as a coach, I was, I know nothing. Um, this, is, this is amazing. Um, so that was my first experience. Um, and I felt that like it was at a really, really high level with really, really good coaches. Um, and I felt that set me off on a really good pathway. Um, from there, I decided to go back to Loughborough or to go to Loughborough University because I wanted to study the sports science and the psychology and the, the different aspects of the game. But I think when you've had a good grind and as that, that sort of set me on my pathway and the different clubs and the different avenues that I took from then, I felt like I was off to a really, really good head start. Um, so that is something I guess that I would advise any young coach um, when you're trying to, you know, develop yourself and grow as a coach is to be really, really selective and I guess to be really, really forceful in terms of seeking out them good early experiences, seek out the very best people that you can early in your coaching career and then that can, can set you off on the path. Once you're off on that path, you make that as you make make of it what you will. You have to eventually grow and become your own person and take what you like and you don't like and you pick different things up from from every manager and, and every coach that you work with and eventually, hopefully, try and put it together into what, what you believe in and how you want to work. If we could just touch on, on academy matters, if I could get your respective views on, on the future of the academy, where you see it going, uh, and not just for Ipswich, for other clubs of a similar size as well. Perhaps, Andy, we'll start with you on that one. Yeah, my involvement in the academy so far has been quite minimal. I've started to work in the first team here and then it's going down. Gary Pro has been brought in to manage that and to move that forward. Um, he's a, a great educator of coaches and players. He's off today on part of his course, spending the day with the Red Arrow. So he's brought a totally different um, 
mindset and learning culture to us. So he will lead on that. And I think the main thing is we want to develop young players that are athletic and robust. Um, I think that's the biggest thing coming from perhaps uh, clubs, I want to say bigger, that have had more selective academies, I think is the athleticism of the young players that we develop is an area we need to improve on. Mark? Um, I think you can break that into, into two elements. I think nationally, none of us actually know where the academy programme is heading. We, we're still waiting for clarification on the, the long-term EPPP plans and um, I've, heard that, I've heard that debated up and down the country for the last, the last two or three years. Um, Ipswich Town, under our tenure, is committed to the EPPP programme, full stop. Um, I think there's a real debate whether you're Cat 1 and Cat 2 other than the games program, I don't see much difference in that. I think what's really important is that we have an absolute pathway for young players through to the first team. Uh, that's why Gary Probert has, has been brought into this, this football club. I think we're, we're really, really fortunate. I think with Kieran um, and his staff, we, I genuinely believe we have world-class coach developers and player developers in our football club. Um, but we have to make sure that, that that development pathway is right for Ipswich Town Football Club. Um, so, again, the EPPP programme we will be part of. We will, if you like, adapt that in whichever way that we see appropriate to support Kieran and, and get players through to the first team. If you look at my background, that's exactly what I've done. If you look at Gary Probert's background in the last four or five years, the players that he has brought through at his former football club, Joe Bryan, Bobby Reid, Wes Burns, Lloyd Kelly, the list goes on and on and on. That's exactly what he does. His job is to work with the academy and the development squads to make sure that those players are fit for Kieran when he deems that they're ready. So I think it's a ex really exciting future for our academy. And what a balancing act for you, Kieran, isn't it? Because uh, you might feel under pressure to play one or two youngsters, but at the same time, it's all what goes on on match days on that pitch and, and getting results. Yeah, I don't think for me it'll ever be a, a pressure to play young players. I, I, I enjoy and have en one of the most enjoyable part of my career is to de has, has been working with young players. I feel that like that um, fits really well with how I work, fits really well with how my, my staff work. Um, we like to work with you know, mouldable young players that we can develop into, you know, our style of football and, and how we want to play. So um, I don't think I'll ever feel that pressure. It's it's something that, um, you know, I look forward to, something that I want. I want a, a good supply and a good um, pathway of, of young footballers um, coming through to the team, obviously primarily and very much so boys from our academy, um, but also boys that we bring in um, externally. Um, as I said, um, not so long ago, I think this is... I believe this is going to be a really exciting place and a really good place for young players to come and develop in their careers um, with what we have in place behind the scenes, what we're trying to develop behind the scenes. Um, I think this is going to be a football club that is highly attractive um, for young players to progress in their careers for a number of different reasons. And I say that's both um, hopefully um, a good amount who, who come through our system and we can help develop them into our team. and. Um, for those who don't make the final step into our team elsewhere in their careers, and also for you know, the best young talent that we bring in nationally um, to develop with this football team as it goes forward. So uh, young players has been a, been a fundamental. It has been the large majority of my career so far. Um, it's, it's something that I'm passionate about, something that I really enjoy, and, and I think a big part of what obviously attracted me to the football club and a big part of the work that I will look to do here. Thank you very much indeed. More questions uh, from the floor, please. One here at the front. Right. Um, regarding um, like team, team selection, that when we have a Saturday-Tuesday game, whether it's in the league and league or league and cup, we seem to sometimes have a load of changes. So when we're at the pub and that before the game, we try and predict the team, I normally get <laughs> nine or ten of them right because I'm off the new school era that, that like they're going to rotate the players. And you see that Ipswich don't have a tend to have a good cup run. Is it because we do tend to keep swapping and changing our teams a lot more than what on a Saturday Tuesday basis of, of games? Um, listen, one one thing it's really important for us that I think we're competitive in every competition. Winning is winning. Winning becomes a habit, um, and uh, I think Kieran has to manage his squad as he he, he sees fit. I mean. Uh, 
League One is brutal. There's, there are no in, real international breaks. The games come thick and fast. Um, but I would expect us to be be competitive in in all competitions. But again, the team selection is is the man to my right. He 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 picks the team. So no pressure, Kieran. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know where the player performance analysis came in to say, like, oh, that player can only play an hour this week and can't play the Tuesday night and that sort of yeah. stuff. We only get involved when we win, is the rest <laughs> of it down to the manager. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, no, we, we have a conversation around those things. I don't think we'd ever say that person can play an hour. The manager's very much as he fit. We have a conversation. Um, and my job is to present information to the manager to allow him to make that decision, whether that's in the form of a graph, whether that's in the form of data and numbers or whether it's just informed in my opinion or my staff's opinion off to the masses get a good feel for days they're busy this friday they were very busy that's fed back to the manager and again it's just a concept and all the managers ever asked me to do is provide him with information okay we'll come back to the floor in a moment first of all let's have a question from tom baines who's been in touch this is for you mark uh, the sponsorship deal with ed sheeran and the kit deal is up with adidas at the end of the season when are we likely to hear about any developments on this? Again, I go, I go back to what I said earlier. There's so much to, to tell. There's such a good story to tell. There's so many people working really hard behind the scenes at the football club. And over the, the coming weeks and months, we will start to, to drip that information out when, when, we, when we legally can. Um, I think, look, we, we've said that we, we're going to invest in the infrastructure of the football club. I can tell you tonight that we have served notice on Sodexo and we will bring in the concourse catering in-house this summer. That's an investment for the football club. Um, um, we, nothing to do with the external company. We want to take control of our own destiny and the owners, investors, board will spend the time in, in putting that in place. I think it's highly likely that in the next 12 months, we will exit the iFollow deal with the EFL and we will build our own platform. I think it's highly likely that you will see Town TV. You will see from next season Ipswich Town uh, offer its own match day commentary. Um, you will see digital, the digital world brought to Portman Road. We will take this football <coughs> club forward, forward in all areas. And it's frustrating for me at times and for, for my team and some of my colleagues sat in front of me because they want to tell the fans everything. Uh, uh, it, but we, we are bound by some commercial and confidentiality agreements. But I'm telling you, there's some really exciting announcements to come for this football club over the next couple of months. So please, please, please watch this space. Uh, Ryan on Twitter, uh, talking about the iFollow coverage, um, perhaps in many ways you've just answered this, but let's put it to you. Is it possible to have multiple cameras for iFollow coverage next season? <laughs> OK, listen, I, again, I'll just tell the supporters the truth. I'm really frustrated at this um, because I'm very aware that, that uh, a team in, in, in League One in Portsmouth have four camera coverage at their games. We currently have one. Um, I'm seeing the EFL on Saturday at our game, and I want to know why our football club hasn't got four cameras when Portsmouth have. We will be relentless. We will fight this club's corner at every opportunity. So it's something I intend to take up personally with the EFL. Marcus and the comms, comms team have been on it. It is moving, but we need to move quicker, and we will push the EFL for equal coverage. Thank you, Mark. More questions? Perhaps um, to my right, perhaps. I haven't had any questions, or we haven't had any questions from from the right-hand side as I'm looking out to you. So now's your chance. No pressure, of course. If not, we'll just stick with the left-hand side. <laughs> we'd just like to get to Seb covering the whole carpet if we possibly can. So have we got a question on the right-hand side? Otherwise, I've got plenty up my sleeve here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Tim Brown again. Um, just uh, a shout-out for Janai Dynastian. Um, as a football club, you must be so proud of him like, personally, he, he was brought to this club and loaned back to the club we brought him from, which is a kick in the teeth, and he took it on the chin and set such an example to the aspiring youngsters in this club. He must be such a role model. And I just wondered how the panel feel about his attitude and his ethic when it comes to football. 
Thanks. Um, what a joy to work with. Honestly, do you know what, what a joy to work with. He, he bounces around the training ground from the first, obviously seen him in the, in the Sunderland game for the first time, but even watching um, the games that I'd watched on video, I was thinking, oh, he's a good player. Um, so looking forward to, to seeing him. Um, and obviously he's had a, a very career and, you know, been through a lot of clubs and um, been around the country and been down the coast and up the coast and back down the coast again. Um, but I can just say what, what, what a joy he is to work with. He's one of the most bubbly, effervescent um, characters you meet. I say he bounces around full of enthusiasm like a 19-year-old like a um, every day. So I can only um, say he's, he's a credit in terms of how he plays himself and the energy that he brings to the group. I didn't, you know, wasn't privy to the situation before and, and obviously, you know, different, different managers have different opinions and, and rightly so. Um, but I can say in my time at football club, he's been a, been a joy to work with and um, a, a really key part of the group on the pitch, but especially off the pitch as well. OK, thank you very much indeed. Any more questions at all? Gentleman at the front here now, Seb. Evening, gentlemen. Um, Chris, it's a very simple question, mainly aimed aim for Mark. You mentioned about the catering. When are we, we going to stop them removing the tops from bottles of water you buy in the club, but you can bring a bottle from outside? Um, we're grown-ups. We're not going to throw uh, bottles on the pitch. Uh, listen, I've... I've yeah. Tr tr trust me, you know, you know what? There are so... If you lived in my world, there's so many things that you come across every every day that that, that, that frustrate me. We look, we we have a really proactive relationship with um, the SGSA, with SAG, um, with the police, etc. I, I think sometimes it's the world that we live in. Um, you know, I had to get involved just to simply allow the Mariner banner to be showed on Saturday. If I hadn't got involved, I'm telling you that didn't happen. Um, and I think sometimes a little bit of common sense has got to come into things. Um, I think, look, when we, with us bringing the catering in-house in, in the concourses, there are so many things we've got to look at. I'll take that point back again. Um, I can guarantee I'll get a very silly answer on, on why, we, why it's not allowed. And, it, and I'll be put... I know. Yeah. Uh, tr tr trust, trust me, I hear what you say, and I can't give you a logical answer why it wouldn't. But somebody will tell me, oh, we can't do that because of this, or we can't do that because of that. But I think sometimes, you know, in football, co common sense has to prevail. Um, and I, I think the staff who have worked with me will agree that we do try, and this ownership group tries to make a, a common sense approach. And I, listen, ultimately, as a CEO, you can't delegate health and safety. Um, but again, I go back to common sense has to prevail. I'll take that back and I'll have some conversations on your behalf. OK, we've got one here for, for Andy um, from Sarah on Facebook. Uh, what are the plans for pre-season? Yeah. Sorry, from who? Who asked? Um, Sarah. Sarah on Facebook. That's not my missus, is it? <laughs> <laughs> she wants to know when you're out of the house. Oh, she, oh. <laughs> That, that could well, that, I'm sorry, but that could well be, that my, my missus and my little one wanted to come tonight, and that could well be her wanting to know when we, if and when we can go on summer holiday. So Andy, you better, you better answer this. Be careful with your answer, because she knows you. She does. I would say this pre-season's been quite difficult. We obviously don't know when the season's ending. We obviously want the season to go on as long as we possibly can. So that's been quite tricky. So we've got several options in progress at the minute. We've also looked, we're desperate to go to Austria. I know the manager likes that area for pre-season. The mountains give great energy for pre-season. So we looked extensively at that. Um, however, we thought the way, the way the world is at the minute, Ukraine, COVID, the decision was making probably by us three that we were going to stay in Britain this year. We've got a few different options. And again, it depends on, the, on the, when we finish. But yeah, the games program is coming together. We will be having a week away somewhere. Um, so yeah, we're definitely staying in Britain. When and where and who, we're still working on. It's very flexible at this moment. She's not going to let you get the way of Andy, I'll tell you. She's going to want... <laughs> I hesitate to use the C word, COVID, but it still ha is having an impact on all our lives. Perhaps not so much as it was, yeah. but it's still being talked about by everybody every day. Yeah, we've still got very rigid uh, protocols at the training ground. We're having to split up 
when the academy come in, those that know the training facility, it's not designed for as many people as we have. So it's getting harder to enforce those rules because society allows us to now be together, but it won't allow us. So we've been probably a little bit boring and not changed anything and we're sticking to it really because I don't want an outbreak of COVID to affect anything that we're building towards for the last month. So we're still pretty much as we were at the training ground. We've perhaps relaxed five, ten percent, but that's it. Um, we're still traveling on two coaches. We've still got players in single beds and we're under pressure from other areas to decrease that, but we're uh, single beds, yes. <laughs> Does that mean summer in I, double uh, beds? I will. <laughs> I'll clarify that instead of twin rooms, single occupancy rooms. Um, and a little known symptom of COVID there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Double beds give you it. Um, so we have made the decision not to make any changes on our COVID protocols until the end of this season. Then we will review it in the summer and see how we can go forwards. Just, just, just on that. The football club is sometimes like a swan. It looks really calm on the surface, but there's a hell of a lot of activity that goes on underneath that people don't see. This football club has one of the best COVID or anti-COVID records in the country, bar none. Andy Rolls, Matt Bayard, the medical team have worked tirelessly and worked wonders to keep our players, our staff safe and to keep the games going. And they deserve a huge credit for that because they don't get the credit they deserve. So well done, Andy. Thank you. Thank you. OK, let's move away from COVID and other matters. Another question here. Uh, to Mark, last summer you said when you first come that you and Paul Cook sorted out basically the players we were going to sign because we didn't have a scouting system. You said that would all be in place. I mean, I've never read anywhere where we've got scouts or whether Kieran bought some of his own here or, or has it been set up a scouting system? It's work in progress. Again, it's an area that reports into Gary Probert. Um, the club has uh, appointed a head of recruitment. That will be announced imminently. Um, we've got uh, technical recruitment and data in place. And yes, we have scouts in place. But we have been searching far and wide for someone to lead that team. Um, and I'm delighted uh, Martin pert has been really influential in, in, in helping us with that. We found that person. Marcus is looking at me very cross because he's worried I'm going to say something I shouldn't. But I would imagine in the next few days you will be seeing an announcement coming out of the football club on who's going to lead that. OK, any more for any more at this stage? Yep. Hi, it's Marion again. A uh, question for Mark. I hear what you're saying about all the work on the stadium and so on, but can I ask you not to lose sight of looking after um, areas that are already a problem. I mean, on Saturday, I, I sit in this stand in the upper level, and I could hear the tannoy on Saturday, so I could actually hear what Foz was saying, which is breath of fresh air, which doesn't happen often. Thank um, you. So that's good, that, that's sorted <laughs> out. But um, things like, can we have some hot water coming out of the taps and the ladies? Can the televisions work so we can see, you know, what people can see on the ground floor? Yeah. And things like that? No, they're on, they're on the list. They're, 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 they are gen genuinely on the list. The Tannoy system, they've actually started work on the Tannoy system. They've been working on the south stand. North stand is next. And by probably the end of April, all the stands will be completed and then be balanced. So we've, we've, we've made that investment. That work is happening. We've, we're investing in water heaters, et cetera, all around the stadium. Um, <coughs> you, you, you point out just a handful of what needs to be done. It's like painting the fourth bridge. We're just going to have to keep going and going and going because it, it, we will do it all, but it's just going to take a bit of time. Um, what I would say to you is if you see things that aren't right, right, drop us an email, let us know, and we'll go straight to the maintenance team. We'll get on it as quickly as we can. Someone wrote to me, I spoke to Kevin a couple of weeks ago about hand dryers not working in specific toilets. That went straight to Kevin, and within 24 hours, that was fixed. Um, so... I, it, it's, it's tough because we've got so much to do and time always feels like it's the enemy. We just can't get things done, done quickly enough. Um, with some of the, the infrastructure projects, with what's going on in Ukraine and delivery times from around the world, trying to get product in is, again, a, a challenge for infrastructure products projects. Sorry, But we, we're on all of it, and I think you make some, some really, really good and valid points. Thanks. Can I just ask you, you say to contact you... Um, 
who should we contact about something to do with stadium? I mean, is it just the general... Send it to me. Mark.Ashton. It's not, not difficult to remember. Send it to me, okay. and, I'll, and then I will, forward, right. I, will, I will forward it on. Look forward to having a full inbox. <laughs> oh, no, no, don't, don't, no, don't worry. It's full, it's full as it is, because it's, it's not, it doesn't take the brains of a rocket science to work out e email addresses, but if it lands, uh, Lynette, who's here tonight, who's my PA, will we'll, we'll grab it and we'll forward it on to Richard or the relevant departments. If you've got the relevant department's email addresses, send it to them. Um, just to take a little bit of pressure off my inbox. Um, but we, we will endeavour to, to get things done. OK, thank you. I'd just like to say Kieran and me don't have email addresses. <laughs> <laughs> One here for Kieran from Harvey Davis. Um, Kieran mentioned when he took the job he doesn't have a preferred system formation. With how successful the three at the back variations have been so far, would it be fair to say this system is now nailed on, or could we still see different formation switches at times? Um, no, I think we'll continue to have that variation as we have done. Um, I'm, I said from my first interview, I'm not a believer in a set system. I don't talk to the players about numbers, even as we work on a day-to-day -day basis. I very rarely talk about 3 4 2 one, four, two, three, one. We, we talk about... Um, roles and responsibilities. We talk about spaces on the pitch that we want to exploit, and um, my belief is um, fitting the qualities of our players around the principles of how we want to play. Um, we've used a lot of different variations already in the 16 games that I've been here. Um, obviously, part of that has been yeah, Wes playing in in a in a wing back role, I guess, with Ginoy behind him most of the time or all of the time in the game so far, but. You know, on the other hand, there's, there's lots of moments of the game where it doesn't look like a back five. It's very much a, a hybrid system we're using at the moment. Um, that's about trying to get the best attributes of the players that we have. Um, and as the squad develops, you know, over time, as the squad develops in the summer, um, again, we'll look at the, the qualities of the players that we have and, and how we fit them best into a system in general for how we can get the, the attributes out of them that we want and then how we can adapt that game to game to come up with game plans that we think will be you know, suitable for each opponent that we play against. So um, I think the style of football hopefully is, is starting to become apparent and how we want to play and the principles of how we want to play. Um, but there'll always be you know, subtle and, and different little changes in the system that you know, might not always go noticed on, on game by game, but that, that we work very hard on behind the scenes to make sure that we're getting the best out of our players, but also we're, we're quite unpredictable and, and difficult for the opposition to be able to know exactly what we're going to do on any given weekend. OK, Kieran, thank you very much. Any more questions? Yep, gentleman on the beanie hat again here. Just at the front here, Seb. Oh, yeah, this is for Mark. Um, just a quick one. Look, I was on social media earlier, and it's, uh, a lot of, it's a lot big issue to a lot of fans and putting fans off buying tickets. But what's the situation with... Uh, seat geek and the uh, booking fees because someone I can't remember how much it was but they'd, they'd renewed their season ticket and bought loads of tickets and it was like £20 in booking fees that's like nearly another ticket for another fan yeah. so I just wonder where we were on that you know I'm glad I'm glad you've raised it because we are we are exactly where we are we were a year ago when I was asked this question the football club is in a very long-term agreement with SeatGeek. It was signed way before myself or Game Change joins this football club. They're a ticketing provider, and it's a deal that we are in. When, when we announced the the, um, uh, the 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 freeze on the prices, we had a real debate around: did we roll in the the, the SeatGeek price and just give a number to the to the season ticket price? And then I, it was me, I was the one who was really concerned. Well, I said, well, actually, if we do that and we give that number, that's not a freeze. And I, I was concerned from a club's perspective. I just wanted honesty and transparency. The booking price is what the booking price is. We are having discussions with SeatGeek. Um, that's not going to be an easy move because it's a long-term commercial agreement this football club's in. Um, I would say to fans, I think the, the response on supporters um, on, on the purchase of season tickets has been fantastic. I'm delighted at four, I'm shocked and delighted at 41% already. Um, new 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 season tickets. Um, we've 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 frozen the prices because we think that's the right thing to do. I was, you know, we've got some smart fans who who, who con contacted me and says, well, actually, Mark, if you look at the the cost of living and the rate of inflation. 
you could say it's a decrease in, in ticket prices, but we, we didn't want to play with any semantics. We just wanted to be honest and tell the truth. Um, but the Seat Geek is a very long-term deal the club's in, and unless we can have difficult conversations with them, it, we are where we are with it. But I can promise you we are having those conversations. OK. Uh, gentleman there with the glasses. Hello. Yeah, David. Um, just wanted, because it's that point, I just wanted to raise this point, the seat geek. What does it actually have to cover the Ipswich ladies' matches? Because if you think about it, the team plays with um, Phillipstone and Walton in their ground, don't yeah. they? Why could those tickets the other week for the cup match not have been sold through that avenue? Um, Sorry, can I just, yep. just say, if you look at the cost to somebody who's like a, a pensioner for that match, yeah. that, that charge was 50% on the entrance fee. Look, tr tr trust me, we, 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 sit, we, we don't take any of these decisions lightly. We sit and debate. Um, the issue was with the quantum of tickets for the, for the game at Felixstowe, we were specifically asked to put them through our system. Um, the, that, that's why it was done for that game. We were asked to do it. Um, normally, it, there isn't that many in attendance. Um, it's a frustration, I get it. I go back to, we've got terms and conditions with a current agreement that I just can't get out of at this moment in time. But you, you make a, a, such a valid point, but I would just, I would reiterate to you that we sit down and we debate the best way. We don't just make a quick decision on this. We, are, we understand the, the challenges that everyone's facing at the moment with the cost of living. And what we want to do is make this football club as affordable and as accessible for, for everyone. <laughs> My challenge to my team, my challenge to supporters, the challenge to me and the players is, is to create an environment where we can really drive the increase in numbers because I think we've seen the benefit to Kieran and his team. I am amazed. 29,000 plus against Sunderland. What was it? 25,000 against Wickham, Lincoln. We've got um, Cambridge at home on Saturday. We're already at, what, 22,000 plus for Cambridge. Luke, Luke, who works with me, keeps putting stats and data in front of me. This is top, top championship attendances we're getting at Portman Road. We want more because I, I, think, I, think, we can, I think we can genuinely get to something like a 28,000 average. One, one of the things that we've talked about, sorry, I think you raised a really good point. Just, just bear with me for a second. I think we've got a responsibility at this football club to inspire a generation because I think the lack of community work that has gone on for a decade in Ipswich and where Norwich and other football clubs have come onto our patch and dominated, we have a responsibility to push back. We have a responsibility to engage with the next generation of fans, take care and love the supporters who've stayed on the journey with us for so many years. When, when you run successful football clubs, alignment is really key. Alignment between the ownership group the chairman, the CEO and the manager is absolutely vital. I promise you, you've got that here. But what's equally important is alignment to the staff and the supporters. Because only if we get really come together can we build this football club. It's too big a football club for this group of people and the players to build and turn on their own. We have an absolute moment in time here for everyone to come together rebuild your special football club and take it back to where it really belongs. We've got to do it together. OK, any more from the floor? If we can just wait for the mic for me, because there's people watching on YouTube probably can't hear. We can hear you nice and loud without the mic, but I, off you go. I just wondered, um, with my question, I don't know if Kieran wanted to say anything. It looked like he was going to say something then. Like the road, Saturday you repeat again, sorry? The Saturday, yeah. Tuesday, whether there's like you play, you, you pick yeah, your team. Um, yeah, I unfortunately haven't had a cup game as of yet with the club. We were hoping, I think, right when it was <laughs> the reminder again, but it was all right before we came and was, was before the, the Barrow game, obviously. So we were hoping we'd have Barnsley. And, um, no, sorry, I don't think I have anything too different to add. Um, that, that relationship will be the same with, with Andy and his team as it is for the Saturday, Tuesdays in the league games that we've had. Um, we'll look at all aspects, one of them being freshness of the players and, and pick a team accordingly. Um, but yeah, it's something I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to um, obviously having an FA Cup tie for the, for the club will be a proud moment for me. 
obviously a Carabao Cup tie and and then we have to look at how we're going to best utilise the, the EFL, um, both for you know how we want to use it for the squad, but how we want to use it as a, a tool to progress some of the younger players as well. Uh, Mark, is it possible that for cup games that season season to cold is actually sitting like the north stand or the cobble stand can actually have a chance to actually sit in their seats rather than sitting in the east of England? No, uh, Madras? no. I'm going to be honest with you. It just it, it, it won't work. Um, you've, you, the economies of scale are we, we have to open the stadium piece by piece. Um, we, we've had this debate internally several times. Um, and in a utopian world, you just open the doors and let people in. But actually, when you've got smaller crowds, actually, you've got to, um, uh, you've got to scale where the fans sit in for those, for those games. So, we, we, again, I've got ticket office here looking at me. Um, with glared eyes, but it's something again we've debated time and time again. Okay, another question here from the front. Um, question from Mark, really. Are we going to ever, ever, ever have a proper ticket office? Pardon? A, a proper ticket office. We have not got a proper ticket office, have we? Selling them in that shop. You go nah. in there, and I don't blame the girls. You ask them a query, they don't know the answer, they have to ring the ticket office. Um, I, I think we, we've had real challenges in the last 12 months, and in fairness to the, the, whether it's ticketing, retail, etc., staffing coming out of COVID and the consistency of staffing on a match day and a non-match day is a real challenge. I think we've got to... Listen, we can improve in all areas, um, but the modern way of selling tickets is online. Uh, um, no, but I think you, if you look at... Um, the, the amount of ticket holders that aren't online, it doesn't, w w with respect, we've, the, the game has moved on. The clubs don't have just plain ticket offices. It's got to be multi-use facilities. So it, it, what we've got to get much better at is making sure that our, re our retail staff are educated in, in, in ticketing so they can answer your questions. And it may be that we need to put more specific ticketing staff into retail, but it's just, it's just not cost effective to have, a, a, if you like, an old fashioned traditional ticket office. Okay. Any more for any more? Lovely. Someone on the right hand side. That's fantastic. Just while we're on the subject of retail, um, especially uh, like this season when season um, card points have been offered as a way of payment. Um, within the shop, a lot of the sizes have sold out rather quickly on shirts. Is that being reviewed for next season? Again, part, un unfortunately, the world that we're living in at the moment, deliveries, the delivery times compared to what we would have had historically have, have just lengthened. To, 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 to get product from overseas has been, a, has been a challenge. I think we've had a couple of concerns with the amount of shirts that uh, Burr St. Selina seems to give away, that we've got enough for him. Um, <laughs> Paul, Paul Macra, head of retail, is nodding here, saying, so can we tell him? Um, I've, got, I've got to tell you t two points to the question. Yes, we are looking at how we can be more effective and, and not have those issues next season. Um, and I think that will be answered in some of the announcements that are going to come over the next few weeks and, and months. Um, we've had a record year in retail this year, uh, and Paul Macro and his team, Paul's here, he should co be commended. Um, our retail numbers are higher than ever, than, and I mean substantially higher than this club's ever achieved in any period in the Premier League. And for a club that currently has been in League One and has been hampered by deliveries because of COVID, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it's been an outstanding performance. And, you know... Paul, to you and your team, your front line, well done, keep it going, but watch out because he's got some really exciting announcements for you in the next couple of weeks and months. I think, Mark, many people um, around the country may have regarded Ipswich um, as a sleeping giant, but the club is clearly wide awake. I think the blue touch paper has been lit. Um, you know, the ownership group, the investors are, are, have been and continue to be absolutely fantastic. But I, I say this to my team every day. We have not come here to just plod along or be a cork bobbing up and down in the water. If that's what people want, you've got the wrong chief executive, you've got the wrong investors. We are here to help rebuild your football club and take it back to where it belongs. Unfortunately, that means change because if we do what we've always done, we will get the same results. 
Um, I genuinely think, I look at the football department now, and we have people who know what world class looks like. Um, 14 weeks in, I'm delighted that Kieran's here, I'm delighted that Martin's here, that Rennie's here, that Charlie's here, and you know, we should mention Charlie as well, who's joined us from Fulham, I think he's been a, a breath of fresh air. Um, and the gentleman on my left, I wouldn't want to be in this project with anyone else because he, you can see tonight, he doesn't particularly like doing these kind of events. We've had, to twi we've had to twist his arm. He's got a bit of stick about his jacket, by the way. He's world class. He's absolutely world class. And I think we've got a world class team that know what good looks like building across this football club. The blue touch paper's been lit. We've got a hell of a lot of work to do. But if we all come together again, I think the future's really, really bright. And again, the owners, investors aren't here, but tr trust me, they're on the phone straight after the game. They're, they're in contact with me most days of the week on different things. They're really invested, not just financially, but emotionally invested um, to, to this football club. And um, I think the future looks extremely bright. Kieran, when you sat in the director's box for the Sunderland game, uh, what were your thoughts? Because it was an exciting time, obviously. We, we knew that, new era and all that, but I don't think any of us realised how exciting it would become in a very short space of time. Yeah, it was, um, it was obviously a really proud moment. I think I came down on the Friday, I believe, and um, you know, got to the stadium and got to meet everyone, and um, Mark and his staff, and... Um, had a good look around the training ground and set plans in place already on the Friday night and um, yeah I had Saturday to walk around the marina in the morning and get a scope of the area and then come to the stadium and I say it was obviously a, a packed out Portman Road promotion that was fantastically done and with the flags and um, you know the environment the numbers that was that was there it felt a really a really special time obviously everyone was excited not just for a, a big game between two two really big football clubs but also hopefully for a new beginning and um yeah, it was, it was exciting to see the team up close. I'd obviously watched a, a lot of video at that point, watched a lot of matches, but you always get that different perspective when you watch the game live. So um, I enjoyed the game and, and um, yeah, it gave me a really good head start to be able to get to work on the on the Monday. Um, and yeah, I think we had the, the next game was called off again, a, a COVID one. So we had a, a good period of time then in the training pitch after that, probably in, in some ways the... The game being cancelled probably helped us because um, we were able to have a good sort of, uh, and you might be able to inform me, but maybe a 10-day training block over yeah. Christmas where we almost had a, a little mini Christmas pre-season when some of the other teams were probably enjoying their, their turkey and their days off a little bit more. We were, we were able to work them and um, we got some good work in place, a lot of off the back of what we've seen in the Sunderland game and um, hopefully that set us up for, for what's been a strong second half of the season so far. But hopefully we're not finished yet. I was going to say, dare you dream of a trip to Wembley? <laughs> um, we all dream. We all dream. So um, we're certainly, uh, it's good to dream. It's good to have something to dream in. Um, as I've said to the players a few times, look, at this, at this stage, the season could have been done already if the playing group had of had of, um, not packed it in because they wouldn't do that because they're a good group of professionals. But if they had a lost belief, if they had of, um, lost the, the spirit in the group, um, the season would have been dead if the, if the supporters base had of um, you know given up on the team. Then possibly the same thing would have happened. We could have been you know playing for for different reasons at this stage and looking and planning for next year. Um, but at the moment it's exciting. Um, the season isn't dead. We haven't given up on anything and and we're just going to take boring to say but one game at a time. Um, obviously we had a really good day here on Saturday, um, but we have Cambridge now and um, that's where all the focus is going to be and. Genuinely, all we can do is, is chip away one game at a time. Hopefully, you know, elongate the season as long as what we can and, and that's see where we end up. But you wiping that slate clean when you came in with all the players has obviously paid dividends pretty quickly. Yeah, I think that's a, a natural process when a new manager comes in um, to, you know, it's a fresh start for everybody. Um, people who've been out of the team maybe see it as an opportunity and, um, you know, that's a... A natural process so yeah that was very much the perspective again it's helped having the extra training time over the Christmas period because you got to know the players a little bit more didn't need to make a team selection within the first days and upset half of them so we were able to look at them and train a little bit more than what we would have been able to do and, and form some opinions and work on some things as a team so um, 
Yeah, I say it's pleased with what I found in the dressing room, pleased with the, the character of, of the group. I think the players have come out and said that um, themselves, even when it was, you know, in, in the difficult periods for the for the team this season and when the team was at its lowest ebb, I still think the dressing room was pretty good. Um, the, the strong leaders in the in the dressing room helped to, you know, keep the motivation there and keep the fight there in the group and um, I saw that from the first day when I arrived that, you know, they wanted to pull together, get behind something and and see if we could um, see if we could take this team forward. So um, again, it's 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 been okay as a start, but it's only a start. And um, unfortunately, there aren't too many games left. I'd be more than happy if there was, you know, 20, 30 games left of the season at this point. I feel fresh. I think the players feel pretty fresh. Um, but at, at the moment, it's it's six league games left, and we can only do what we can do. And um, we look to do that on Saturday and, and see where we are after that. Okay, some more time for some more questions. We've got another 10 minutes or so, so we'd love to hear from more of you. Some hands going up now, some fresh hands as well. Just a question for Mark. You mentioned Martin's been involved in the process of getting ahead of recruitment in. Um, will we be utilising his links across Europe um, to bring in some overseas players maybe in the summer? Well, Luke Waring's at the back of the room. Apparently he's going off to Brazil. Um, <laughs> to Coca Cabana Beach do a bit of recruitment. Um, um, yeah, the, the answer to that is we, Andy and I have known Martin for what, 20 years plus? Yeah. He, he, we work, we've worked with him before, and as Kieran, he's, he's the most connected man ever. Yeah, he's got a, a very, very hefty phone book. I laugh at him every day because anyone I mention anywhere in the world of football, he says, Oh, yeah, I know him. I spoke to him yesterday. <laughs> so I, I don't know if I tell him, I, I don't have time to ring anyone other than my, other than my family. Um, but Martin seems to make time to make 50 phone calls a day. So, um, yeah, he's, he's very well connected, as, as Martin uh, jo or, uh, Mark jokes about the South America one, but he's, he's very well connected across, across Europe from his travels and his work in football in a long time. But that obviously that extends to South America as well and his networks out there. So um, look, that's not to say that we're going to sign the Brazilian <laughs> national team all this summer, but <laughs> is to say that, you know, within the, the remit of... Um, Brexit laws and what we can bring in and what we can get visas into this country, um, we would be looking to cast the net wide and look at all markets for if there's if there's talent out there, uh, you know, at the right the right stage and the right age that can come and add to this football club. Then that's something that we'll do. Something that Martin has been a, a part of thus far and will grow going forward, but also part of the, the new recruitment team's scope as and when they when they start at the football club. Okay, some more hands have gone up. As I say, we've got a bit of time for a few more questions, so if you're desperate to ask a question, get in as soon as you can. Hi, uh, Tim Brown again. Um, the rumour mill was that we were after some striker from uh, League Two level. Um, I can't even remember his name, but apparently he'd scored 11 goals or something in 100 oh. appearances and he's a hot prospect, etc. But at the same time, we've got Tyrese Simpson, who went on loan to Swindon, scored 12 goals, I think, in not many appearances, and we brought him back to Ipswich. I know he's currently injured, but when we brought him back, he didn't even get on the bench, and we weren't scoring many goals at the time. We weren't losing, but we weren't our goals had kind of dried up, and I just wonder why the club brought him back from that learning curve on loan to Swindon to not give him a place on the bench and also not sort out his contract situation. Uh, I'll take this. Yeah, on. Yeah. Um, look, in terms of the rumour mill and us being linked with a striker from League Two, I think certainly when you work at Manchester United, you learn not to, not to look at the rumour mill too much. Um, the large majority of what tends to be out there in terms of transfer gossip and stuff take it as a, as, as a pinch of salt. So um, I'm not sure what player you're referring to there, but I, I wouldn't imagine there's anything too concrete in that. In terms of Tyrese's situation, um, I can speak on it from a football perspective and, and maybe Mark can add a little bit of detail. Obviously, Tyrese is a player I didn't know coming into the club so well, a player who's gone on his, his first loan experience and had a a productive experience at um, Swindon in the first half of the season. Um, I think I've, I've said publicly before, so it's, it's no um, news. Tyrese's you know, 
discussions and recall was around his contract situation and his commitment to the to the football club and something that um, the club were working with him and his representatives on um, at the time when he was called at the end of January it wasn't to be involved in our first team squad it was um, a recall to have some discussions about his future at the club with the view to going back out on loan again at the end of January um, then discussions didn't progress as obviously either party wanted at that time to a satisfactory end so then the obviously the window closed and Tyrese is um, you know currently part of the part of the football club and I've had conversations with him through the process and said that you know um, we wanted to get the right thing sorted for his um, development but also for the rest of his season and, and I think the club tried to work with him towards that um, so long as he's in the football club I want to work with him and and develop him because I think he's got potential to be part of this football club going forward. So um, since he has returned to the to the club, which wasn't planned as a you know as an addition for us for the second half of the season, um, he's had opportunity to train with the first team. I say hampered by um, a little injury, but he's now actually back in full training. Um, has been training well and is as currently stands uh, an option and a um, an availability for us in an area of the pitch where we have really big numbers. Um, and we have depth, but also where Tyrese can give us a, a different attribute. So um, at the moment, he's training well. He's, he's probably going into his second full week of training with us as a group. So I'm getting to know him a little bit better. Um, the rest of the squad are getting to know him and his attributes a little bit better. And um, it's up to him to now keep showing and training that he can contribute for us for the rest of the season. And then beyond that, again, I'm having conversations with Tyrese on a regular basis about... Um, his future, his um, how I see his development, how I see him as where his part in this in this team going forward could be, and um, you know it's up for for Tyrese, his representatives, and Tyrese to continue. Obviously, talks with the club on a, on a contractual situation to you know hopefully find something that you know each party can be happy with, and um, Tyrese can you know continue his development and hopefully have a part to play at Ipswich Town. Uh, any other additions to that one for Mark? Or? Well, uh, listen, uh, what, what I would say, listen, it, it's wrong of me to talk about any, any individual player's contract, but one thing I can promise our supporter base is I will fight tooth and nail for this football club. And this football club will not in any way, shape or form be agent or representative-led. Doesn't work. Doesn't work for me. Won't work for this ownership group. Ipswich Town will decide where its young players go, what's best and what contracts are, are, are put in front of them and how that works and how that pathway works to the first team. And it's the same for the senior boys. We have good relationships we, with um, most of the agents across the world. We have a big wide network in that. And I think if you, if you, if you look at the career of myself and the people around me, we've been really successful uh, in what we've done in player trading. Our job is to protect this football club. Uh, and at times, that, that's tough. And it's a tough world with, with, with agents um, at times. But we have to protect the football club. And if we don't show strength at certain times, trust me, our football club will get walked all over. I've seen it time and time again. So we need to do the right thing. Um, nothing's ever personal. Sometimes it's business. My job is fundamentally to protect um, Ipswich Town Football Club. And that's what I will do right up until the last second I'm here. Um, but we try and do it in the right way, by the way. We have good relationships with most, if not all, agents. Um, and they, they're happy to bring play, players here because we do contract um, and pay people in the right way. We incentivise them. We develop those contracts. And again, on, on the playing side, you, you've got coaches who will develop them. So I think, as Kieran said, this football club will be a really uh, appetising place for young players to come for, for many years ahead. Thank you very much indeed. Time for one more question, perhaps, and then we will call it a night. <coughs> Gentlemen here, Seb, sorry to run you around. Come on, Seb. <laughs> chop, chop. Hello there. Um, firstly, thank you very much for giving our football club back to us again and actually enjoy watching it. It's actually fantastic. One thing a lot of fans are frustrated with, though, are corners. We do not <laughs> score for a corner. You're not the only one. All over, <laughs> <laughs> all over 200 corners, maybe 250. That's his last score from a corner. And set pieces. Um, you're probably limited what you didn't do so far. But moving forward, are you going to get a specialist um, set, piece, set piece coaching at all to work on those areas and make us stronger? Because that could make a difference sometimes in some games. 
It's definitely a massive area, and you're right to address it, and it's something that we're, we're very aware of. I think it's, I can't go through the record exactly before I arrived, but it's, it's 16 games since I've been here that we haven't scored a set play, and it's, I would say, borderline impossible to get out of this division with that record on set plays. Um, you, normally across the course of football, it's above 25% of all goals usually come from set plays, and I, and I believe in this division it's even higher. So... Um, it's a massive area that we need to make improvement on. Um, in a way, I see that as a positive. I see it as if what we've done so far, we've done it without scoring set plays. So if we can add that to our, to our artillery, then um, you know, I think we can be another, a different threat as a team. Um, so it's something we need to work on. It's, it's all aspects for me, set plays. It's, um, you know, it can be a recruitment issue. It can be bringing in players who are good set-piece deliverers, who are set-piece threats. Um, that can be one part of it. It's definitely a, a coaching issue. It's developing those skills within the players that we have um, to develop our set-piece takers to get a more consistent delivery um, and the type of deliveries that we want. And then also it's an area that we need to develop in, in our players. Um, you know, We need to be more of a, a penalty box threat in general, but certainly on set players we need to carry more penalty box threat. So it's an area that we're, we're working on with the players ever more so than... Um, at the moment, but an area that we're going to invest a huge amount of time of going forward and certainly into pre-season with the squad. Um, in terms of a specialised set-piece coach, I think that is that is one avenue in football um, that is growing in the game. Um, I don't think it's it's necessarily a, a unique skill point. I think the line between a set-piece coach and a football coach is very thin. It's, it's the similar skill set that you need in a lot of aspects. Um, I feel that we have good um, experience in, that, in the staff in that area. Um, our defensive record in set play, as much as I say we haven't scored one, I think we've conceded, although it was a, a very wounding goal, but the goal at Oxford was uh, the only <laughs> set piece that we've conceded as well. So it? it was a very good one, a good delivery and a good header. So it's, it's not by accident, and they've done that over the course of a season, and it's part of the reason they've scored so many goals. So... Um, <sighs> It's not by accident. It's something that needs to be worked on. I feel that we have a lot of those skill sets in the staff at the moment. Um, I am going to add to the coaching staff over the summer and the uh, um, development of set players is something that I'm going to look at and work very hard on um, within the coaching staff to um, ensure that we can develop the players in that area. And also it will be part of our recruitment thinking towards the summer is that um, bringing in players who can help us become a more dangerous team on attacking set plays and more solid on defensive set plays. So you're very right to address it. I know it's a, a, um, a, an area of the team that is, you know, um, an immediate area that we can improve. And I say I take that as a positive challenge and I look at that and think that if we can develop that area of the team, then, you know, the, our capabilities and our ceiling as a team is going to be much, much higher. Well, that concludes what's been a fantastic session. Please uh, give our panel a big round of applause for Mark, Kieran and Andy. Thank you very much indeed, gentlemen. Thank you to Seb, who's the man holding the microphone. And um, it's been a real pleasure, me actually holding the other microphone and, and speaking into it. Lovely to see you all again. Um, have a safe journey home, and we'll do it again sometime, hopefully. Bye for now.